Good morning, good evening, good afternoon from wherever you are around the globe and welcome to the webinar series on Islamic financing and public-private partnerships. I'm Sada Ahmed. I'm a PPP knowledge consultant with the public-private partnerships group of the World Bank based here in Washington, D.C. This webinar series is organized jointly by the Open Learning Campus and the public-private partnerships group of the World Bank. Today, our topic of discussion is addressing the basics and relevance of mobilizing Islamic finance to PPPs. More recently, we are seeing that Islamic finance is starting to emerge as a significant source of funding for PPP infrastructure projects, such as airports, toll roads, independent power plants, and hospitals. This webinar series, as a joint initiative of the World Bank Group and the Islamic Development Bank, over the next few months, will focus on increasing knowledge on Islamic financing within countries looking for infrastructure finance and better facilitation of the use of Sharia compliant instruments for mobilizing private investment in infrastructure through PPPs. Today, we will focus a bit on the background of the global Islamic financing industry as a whole and as part of infrastructure financing and the predominant Islamic finance modes that are currently being used for, in for financing PPP projects. Our main speaker today is Fida Rana. Fida is a senior expert at the Islamic Development Bank and has vast experience in project and infrastructure finance, credit risk, Islamic finance, and PPPs. He has led the structuring and financing of multiple infrastructure PPPs across the globe and currently is leading the PPP origination and execution initiatives of the Islamic Development Bank in countries across Asia, Eastern Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. FIDA has been instrumental in arranging, underwriting, syndicating structured loans in a wide range of industries, including power, mining, oil and gas, and the social infrastructures. We also have today with us my colleague here, Ajaz Ahmed, a senior PPP specialist from the PPP group at the World Bank. Ajaz brings over 20 years of experience in project finance, infrastructure development, PPPs, and privatization. Before joining the World Bank Group, Ajaz provided project finance and PPP advisory services in the Middle East and South Asia markets as chairman and CEO at Pangea Growth, as well as was the CEO of the Infrastructure Project Development Facility, a company created by the Federal Finance Ministry of Pakistan to act as its central PPP unit. Ajaz was also a founding member and acting head of the PPP unit in the National Treasury of South Africa. So I'd like to also recognize our webinar production team today, which includes Shamila Shukla, uh, myself, Rupi Rai, Zichao Wei, Ajaz Ahmed, and Jeffrey John Delman, all members of the PPP group at the World Bank. And now I'll go over the quick agenda um, where we will have our presentation given by Fida Rana, followed by a brief question and answer session and a closing. So feel free to send us your questions via chat and we will be monitoring that and hope you enjoy this presentation. Over to you, Fida. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, good day, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining uh, this web webinar series, the very first one. Uh, we're gonna have uh, three all together uh, in, in coming months. Uh, what uh, I'm going to do uh, over the next 30 minutes time, uh, we'll essentially touch upon the Islamic finance, uh, its relevance and application in funding PPP projects. That will be the main focus. Uh, and this particular topic has really gained considerable interest uh, among the practitioners, the policymakers, academia, as well. Uh, and you might have noticed that the G20 forum at us particular attention uh, to Islamic finance under the infrastructure investment working group. Uh, so this topic is, is very, very pertinent and very much timely. Uh, and I, I really thank uh, World Bank Group to, to organize this, uh, to initiate this uh, webinar series. So let me tell you what we're gonna cover uh, over the next 30 minutes. And uh, I was looking at the at the participants' profile, and uh, I've noticed that you know um, you are coming from quite diverse backgrounds. Some of you might have Islamic finance 
uh, prior knowledge. Some of you are perhaps uh, for the first time here in Europe. Uh, so considering the, the audience uh, diversity, what I have taken, I've taken a very soft approach. So what I'll, 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 I'll do, uh, uh, I'll, I'll start with a general, very global overview about this kind of financial industry. And then uh, I will go and zoom in into the Islamic finance and its uh, relevance or, or feed into the infrastructure uh, uh, project finance uh, within the scope of PPP. And while we will discuss that, we will also uh, touch upon the Islamic finance tools, uh, the modes that are that are used uh, for for Islamic uh, finance participation in, in PPP projects. Uh, because you know uh, there are a lot of tools available in, in Islamic finance, so not everything is equally applicable for PPP projects. So we'll discuss about the tools that are particularly important for PPP projects. And finally, towards the end of the presentation. Uh, I will talk about some of the real life case studies, uh, real life projects I'm going to present you, which uh, used uh, Islamic finance. So that's basically the overall outline of, of uh, today's presentation. Uh, let me start with a global overview of, of Islamic finance. Um, if you look at the current size of Islamic finance, um, it is um, as of 2015, the expert estimate is that it crossed the mark of uh, $2 trillion. In 2013, it was $1.66 trillion globally. And if you look at the composition of Islamic financial assets, uh, you have the uh, Islamic banking assets, then Sukuk, which is basically the uh, Islamic equivalent of bonds. You have Islamic funds and Takaku, which is known as the insurance. Uh, the practice, the assets are mainly concentrated uh, in, in Middle East and North Africa, MENA region, but the industry has seen definitely a quite significant growth uh, in, in, um, in other parts, like especially Southeast Asia, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, and that part of the world. The growth trajectory as I said, is, is very impressive. And this is an industry we are talking about right now, which started about 40 years ago. Uh, so from a very modest start uh, around 1975, 1976, we are now talking about industry that has, that has reached something like a, a two trillion dollars. To, to put things into perspective, this is slightly bigger than the GDP of Canada. So you can understand the size of the Islamic finance industry globally. And uh, what are the fastest growing segment of the Islamic finance industry? Definitely Suku, uh, because a lot of uh, Suku you see coming from the government on the southern side. There are copper Sukuks. Uh, if you look at the number uh, by the end of uh, 2014, third quarter. The outstanding Sukuk was about $295 billion. And it has grown to the extent of 21% between 2008 and 2013. Quite a phenomenal growth indeed. So it's a very big industry growing double digits. The question is, how does it operate? What are the global frameworks? What are the what is the ecosystem under which the Islamic finance, financial industry, the bank, financial institutions, they are, they are working. And um, you'll, be, you'll be seeing here that there's an extensive um, standard setting institutions, uh, the regulators, the facilitators that are in place, which basically uh, set the framework of the whole ecosystem of the Islamic financial industry. Uh, you have to start with, um, let me put the pointer. Uh, IOFI, which is known as the uh, accounting and auditing uh, organization of the Islamic financial institution. This is an independent industry body 
mainly dedicated to the development of international standards, which are applicable for Islamic financial institutions. Then you have Islamic Financial Services Board, which is again responsible for some standard setting institution, which promotes and enhances the soundness and the stability of Islamic financial services. And by the way, these are very much, all these institutions are complementary institutions. They are not kind of competing each other. Each institution are working in a particular area of the global Islamic financial industry. You have Islamic financial market. Then we have Islamic Fiqh Academy, which talks about the setting the Sharia standard, globally speaking. Then you have Islamic rating agency, which rates the Islamic financial products. So all these different standard setting uh, organizations as a whole are facilitating the growth of Islamic financial industry globally. They are setting the necessary standard. Uh, and uh, uh, you see that there's a whole gamut of uh, these institutions, uh, which, and uh, each, each one has their own uh, website. And if uh, any of you, particularly interested to know the uh, role of each institution, please feel free to visit their website and uh, we'll get more information over there. Okay, so with this background of Islamic finance, the global context, what I would like to go in the next phase uh, to talk about the infrastructure finance, infra infrastructure uh, finance need, Islamic finance and PPP. Uh, there is huge need for, for infrastructure finance. If you look at the reports coming from G20, uh, there is the world approximately spends about $9 trillion infrastructure and out of which uh, there, is a, there is a huge gap uh, despite the fact that the, the spending is about $9 trillion US dollar per year. The gap is currently estimated the 60 to 70 trillion US dollar over the years until 2030. That translates into approximately 1 trillion US dollar gap per year. So that sets the ground that you know all, all the financial institutions that are working towards funding infrastructure projects globally. There is a steel gap, and that's why there is a need to tap in all the available resources, be it conventional finance, be it you know, Islamic finance, or any other modes of finance. At the same time, you'll understand that you know, in the overall context of global infrastructure finance, then, then you have majority of global infrastructure finance being funded by the conventional banks, conventional financial sources of which also you have a subset of Islamic financial institutions who provide the funding for the, for the infrastructure project, both for the sovereign and the non-sovereign projects. And again, within the Islamic financial sources, financial institutions providing uh, funding for the infrastructure projects, you have another subset, which is particularly focused for PPP kind of projects, Islamic finance for PPP. So what is the risk? Like Islamic finance for, there may be Islamic finance for infrastructure projects that are not necessarily done through PPP. So what we are discussing today in today's presentation and in, in the coming uh, webinars in the series, you need to keep this thing in mind that we are focusing on a very focused, a specialized part of the global infrastructure finance segment or sub subset, which is Islamic finance for PPP. And um, as we will discuss this, uh, we will talk about the about the various modes of Islamic finance that are being used for PPP type infrastructure projects. And overall, we'll see that the major sources of funding are coming from, of course you know this, on the equity side and the debt side. On the debt side, we'll talk about, as I talked, discussed at the very beginning, we'll talk about the ujara or leasing. Then we'll talk about the construction finance, these are the two modes, 
and also we'll talk about another mode of financing called restricted mudaraba these three modes are basically used for islamic finance uh, as a as a vehicle uh, to participate or to fund or ppp projects we'll also discuss the coexistence with conventional lenders and this is a very important topic that in a single ppp projects because most of the ppp projects you know are are big in nature they need investments which not necessarily can be funded by single lender so you you may have uh, more than one lender actually most of the cases you will have more than one lender and when you have more than one lender uh, not necessarily you will have uh, only islamic lenders you will have conventional lenders islamic lenders usually. so how these two group of lenders they come and join hand and fund ppp projects this is a very interesting topic and we will we will discuss this uh, uh, in this uh, seminar webinar and along with the coming to webinars i also want to set the ground about uh, what kind of projects we are talking about and that will help us to to understand the participation of islamic finance in a, in a ppp project so we'll start we'll take the model of uh, a very simple plain vanilla ppp infrastructure project where you have a spd or, or uh, you know a special purpose vehicle you got the concession from the government as implementing a ppp project uh, the spd is being funded by utility and islamic lender we will start with a single lender model that, that that's easy to understand and then we will increase the level of complexity so you have the equity funding coming from equity and funding coming from loan side with the islamic lender and the project company has its own uh, contractual arrangement with, with etc contract with the owner contract this is the overall a typical plain vanilla ppp project structure and we will keep that in mind as we go to the participation of islamic finance in ppp and over time once we understand how this is done uh, in terms of islamic finance participation we will increase the level of complexity a little bit by introducing conventional lender into the picture which is basically the parallel lender model uh, known as parallel lender model. as a matter of fact uh, as i said majority of the projects ppp projects where you see islamic finance islamic lender will also see conventional lender which is the parallel lender model that you see on the screen but we are starting with a single lender model that is because that's the very simple one to understand and then once we have an understanding about the single lender model it will be easier for for everybody to 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 introduce and understand the conventional lender into the picture so as a, again um, let's look at the uh, diagram you have the spd in, in the middle and the spd needs funding and it's getting its fund from equity and getting its fund from from lender lending side when you talk about equity and right now i'm i'm going to talk about the islamic aspect both when you talk about the equity and you talk about the about the lending side equity is by definition in a sharia compliant so it's a risk sharing uh, instrument you, you invest you take the risk and you, you, you gain the return uh, but however um, when it comes to ppp projects you will see there are institutional um, investors who come up with equity investment uh, i would say equity window from various banks let's say or dedicated islamic infrastructure fund and they need to check couple of other criteria uh, before really investing into the project it's not because every equity uh, equity is by definition sharia compliant doesn't mean that you know they can offer equity in the project for example from the equity perspective if 
Islamic lender or Islamic equity investor goes into an, uh, a project, there is generally a Sharia requirement. And by the way, uh, I, I emphasize the word generally because it can vary from institution to institution. But uh, this is a view uh, that is being subscribed by the majority of the Islamic uh, investment institutions. That that a substantial portion of the debt, the lending side of the venture where equity is going, should be Sharia compatible or Islamic. Islamically based, uh, and uh, majority means you know it could be 66 percent, uh, almost two thirds. And of course, you you need to have the venture, the project working uh, that is not uh, you know uh, in an industry not being supported by Sharia. So these are the few criteria that uh, the equity investor, Islamic equity investor, has to look into when they go for. PPP projects. When we go on the on the lending side, the predominant mode of funding for Islamic finance is known as leasing, tijara. I will use. I'll try to use the um, terminology that is being used by conventional banks you know, just to just to convey the message easily. Uh, it's known as tijara. What is what is done here is that the Islamic bank um, they own the asset and they lease it to the uh, SPV. Uh, let me let me go to the diagram and perhaps it will be easier, yeah, easier to follow. So let, let's take the case of um, uh, of an SPV who who needs funding from an Islamic bank, and let's talk about. You know, Islamic Development Bank is the lender here, and we have the SPV. So, when the Islamic Development Bank wants to lend to this project, PPP project, what it will do is that it will, it can take the route of leasing. And here you can follow from the chart that it will sign a lease agreement to start with with the borrower. Here, the borrower is the SPV. And the lease agreement has got, you know, some other, it's a, it's a set of agreements. We're talking about lease agreement, service agreement, agency agreement. So when they sign that agreement, the second step would be that the borrower, SPV, signs a procurement agreement with a vendor. And as I, as I, Told you about the plain vanilla structure of a PPP project. The vendor would be in case of uh, this project, let's say EPC contractor. So let me go back to that slide. Perhaps it will be easier for you to follow here. We are talking about project company and Islamic lender IDB. They are going to sign a contract and they sign the contract of lease agreement and then the project company will sign another contract with the EPC contractor in order to procure that particular asset. The question is, if it is a leasing, the ownership of that asset should be with the Islamic lender, IDB. So how they do that? They do that because the way the Islamic lender authorizes the project company to procure the asset on behalf of the lender. And that's where Let's go back to our chart. That's how it works. That's the step two. The SPV goes ahead and procures the particular component from the supplier. It could be, let's take the case of the power project. It could be a piece of generator. You know, it could be a piece of any other equipment in the, in the, in the whole power complex. So once they get the delivery of the asset, the bank here, the Islamic Development Bank, let's say, they directly pay to the EPC contractor. In the context of project finance, PPP projects, and when we will introduce multi uh, lender case, uh, for example, um, uh, the conventional lender and Islamic lender, you will see that in that case, the money is routed through. Uh, an agent bank because there are different banks involved, but they need to disburse uh, 
at the same time pro rata and that's why you know uh, the money first goes into a pool and then the ag agency bank they give just to the EPC contract so the project so and this happens during the construction time of the PPD project right so the construction is over the asset is delivered to the STB to the project company and the project achieves its financial closing and then it starts paying back to the lender the rent that's how a plain vanilla ijara or or leasing structure uh, works for a ppp project and you will see that a, a good number i think um, from our experience uh, majority of the ppp projects that we have seen are done in this format it has got some additional flexibility additional you know um, uh, features that makes it uh, rather easier uh, when it comes to multi lender project because um, to leasing you are able to charge uh, variable rate uh, and the most of the conventional lenders they do charge variable rate the the second type of uh, uh, mode which is being used uh, is known as isna uh, i'll use the word construction finance might it may not be the exact uh, translation but let's use it for the, for the sake of understanding the difference between isna in the context of ppp project uh, when comparing to ijara is that isna is used mainly for building or constructing assets that are not in, in place right at the moment. For example, when you want to develop project, uh, PPP project in road sector, in airport sector, in seaport sector, so you have to construct the road uh, as opposed to, let's say, power plant where many of, many of the equipment, generator, turbine are very much standard uh, configuration you can go and you can buy those but here in case of other ppp projects like roads you have to make it specific to the requirement of the ppp project which is the concession that the government is asking for and for that matter uh that kind of project a most more suitable islamic mode of financing we use is what is called istisna and the istisna to some extent the 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 flow here uh, works in the same way you have just seen in case of Ijara. The difference would be, I would say, that um, here the the selling of the asset instead of transferring the asset uh, takes place right after the construction work. So after the construction work, the title of the asset is passed to the borrower to the SPV, and then the SPV pays back the bank the price of the asset over a deferred payment uh, mechanism. Now, you perhaps know that in Islamic finance, there's a concept called ghar, which is, means that uncertainty. Uncertainty is not allowed in Islamic finance. So the question is, uh, if the SPV wants to purchase the asset, and then it wants to repay over a long period of time, it needs to know the price of the asset upfront. And that's why when the construction finance or ISPISNA is used, the, the repayment profile for ISPISNA financing, as opposed to Islamic um, Ijara financing, sorry, the, in case of ISPISNA, the pricing is fixed, it's not variable. That sometimes creates a little bit of complexity when it comes to uh, the parallel lending model where you have uh, conventional banks who typically charge a variable rate, whether it is EV bor plus or it is LIBOR plus. Now you have another lender into the picture, Islamic lender, who is charging uh, a fixed rate. So how do you really make them at par? And there are mechanisms to do that, and we will, we will discuss that in, in the coming days. And then finally, we have called restricted mudaraba, which is essentially a line of financing that we use for PPP projects. 
this is relatively speaking a uh, 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 a recent model that uh, we started using in ptp project the model itself is not new but in in the context of application of restricted mudaraba in in ppt is new the way it is done basically we allow the uh, we allow the company uh, to to take a line of financing and use it for for uh, for on, on lending so these are the three modes of financing of course for for islamic finance and uh, i am on the last part of my presentation i want to very quickly uh, take you because we have uh, i would say limited time we are trying to cover an industry that we grew over 40 years in 30 minutes time so uh, the dorale ppp container terminal has been done in djibouti uh it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a terminal project deep sea port which used islamic finance and uh, it was funded by islamic development bank along with dubai islamic bank Eastern chartered bank uh, african development bank and other lenders it used the mode called ijara or leasing uh there is a power plant it was done in bangladesh recently with other mdbs um ifc and asian development bank and idb islamic development bank uh, islamic development bank provided the ijara mode of financing for this project we have very recently done a hospital project in turkey as i said the hospital is very much specific to the requirement of the government under the concession agreement so what we did here we we we, we used istisna mode of financing for for the hospital project and here also you have uh, other development banks and commercial banks uh, present in the in the picture jordan uh, the airport project in jordan if you have ever have been there an excellent excellent project uh, my favorite destination it was done through islamic finance jointly with with, with ifc and we used istisna for this project uh, to the tune of uh, 100 million us dollar by idb so these are you know few projects it gives you an idea about trans transport sector the power sector hospital sector when so different sectors we have been using uh, islamic finance quite successfully along with conventional lenders along with other mdbs and these projects are are out of the four projects i just mentioned three are complete uh, operation and the hospital project is about to start construction these are all all real life projects uh i think that with 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 that um, uh discussion i would like to highlight uh one one common and that's the end part of my presentation a very common misconception that we, we always hear from from uh, others that uh, you know uh, what, what's the difference between islamic finance and, and conventional finance they're going to charge the same amount you know can cost everything uh i think that the 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 difference actually you'll see and i always use this i know so you may feel hungry by looking at that i always use this example uh, that just by looking at the burger would you be able to really tell which one is prepared uh, what we call the halal and which one is not which is not prepared according to halal so you need to understand that you need to go out of your you know dining table and go to the kitchen and see how it has been executed and it has been prepared some finance to some extent exactly like that you know when you purely look at the economic aspect of islamic finance you may see that it is offering the same terms and conditions economically speaking to the borrower but when you look at the you go beyond that and look at the structure look at the look at the the, the documentation that the underlying assets then only you will see the difference Uh, of Islamic finance in general. Over the coming webinars, you know, I have I have mentioned about four projects and the uh, four different structures that we used in those projects. Uh, over over the coming two seminars, what we'll do, we'll we'll pick up 
to a specific projects and go detailed into those projects discuss about the documentation of islamic finance what are the state of legal uh, documentation what is the structure how the different issues when it comes to you know mingling with uh, uh, conventional banks are being addressed uh, in, in those in those projects few issues that we will 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 discuss of course uh, in addition to the legal documentation in addition to the structure we'll talk about the security sharing uh, how the security between the islamic bank and conventional banks are being shared uh, there's a question about hedging uh, how do you hedge the interest rate exposure, exposure or for that matter currency exposure in a, in a project when it comes to islamic finance how about the the, the variable versus fixed pricing you know i told that in case of istisna uh, the charge fixed pricing but on the other hand you may have other lenders charging variable pricing what is the mechanism you make the, make sure that they are at par and what is what is not permissible in the context of islamic finance and fee projects and what are permissible so we'll, we'll discuss those issues hopefully in in in, in coming days and uh, with that uh, uh um slide i think i have reached to the to the end of my presentation um sara ejas over to you um we will now turn it over to ejas um who will give a little bit it would be good to hear some of your feedback uh remarks and then kick off the q and a portion thank you and thank you for that that was a very informative and very insightful presentation uh, to be very honest all the burgers look equally appetizing um, so you know it this was uh, uh, as you said it's a, it's a subject which is a whole discipline and we are trying to sort of uh, uh, look at it, at at the big picture in this first webinar uh as you said you know the it has a long history now almost uh, 50 years uh you know they say that you know the first islamic bank opened in 1963 in egypt so it's come a long way the growth has been steady um you know we have uh, 2 uh, trillion dollars worth of assets in the market now um and we have a fairly developed ecosystem like you like you know you i like the term ecosystem for uh, islamic financing consisting of you know standardization uh, the markets themselves and the rating agencies um we now have uh, you know islamic finance operating in 75 muslim and non muslim countries uh, and 275 islamic financial institutions globally so i think uh, you know when we move into the question answers uh, what we see is uh, you know also this this issue which people are bringing up which has to do with the, the labeling of this mode of financing uh, I, I think it's uh, you know we we are uh, we are classifying uh, a mode of financing by giving you know it's associating it with uh, with uh, a, a religion and some of the questions are you know, does it uh, create, uh, uh, you know, perception issues? Uh, but, you know, the way I, I see it, you know, it's a form of structured finance uh, in which, you know, like you said, you know, we are avoiding uh, uh, interest. We are avoiding uncertain contracts. We are avoiding issues like gambling. And, uh, you know, we are doing it, you know, in conjunction with uh, conventional lending. So, uh, what we have is focus on the projects, uh, uh, not you know saying that we, you have to have a uh, hundred percent Sharia compliant uh, environment in a country before you start uh, dealing with you know Islamic finance, and especially you know when it comes down to PBPs, which is a subset. Uh, and now what we see is is are, are, are good examples. Of projects happening, like you said, in the MENA region, Middle East, North Africa. Uh, interestingly, you know, my, you know, within the within the PPPCCSA, 
you know, I'm the focal point for the MENA region and uh, whenever you're, you're traveling in the region, you know, it's a very common question that's asked. And uh, so even though there is experience, but, you know, there's somehow it's not reaching out to, to the people. And I, I think Islamic Development Bank definitely has a big role in, in uh, promoting this even further. When, uh, when we advertised, uh, you know, when people were regi registering for the course, we had some questions which were given to us at the time of the registration. And, you know, those questions sort of uh, are, are aligned with what I was talking about earlier. It's, uh, it's uh, you know, the, 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 the information vacuum out there. So, for example, questions from uh, Pavial, Anand, and uh, uh, Eco talk, you know, they, they say, is, is uh, you know, uh, Islamic financing applicable to project finance and PVPs, and you've already talked about that. And they want to know, you know, exactly which countries. You broadly talked about the region, uh, but maybe narrow it down to, you know, countries with more experience. And then they, you know, they, there's this question about what are the legal uh, and uh, regulatory considerations while undertaking PVPs. Uh, do we have to have a perfect environment, or can we go directly to projects and 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 deal with issues on a contractual basis? And uh, are there any good case studies available? And as an extension to 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 this, uh, what the questions that were asked at the time of the registration, uh, I I would just like to sort of uh, uh, you know request you to also talk about the fact that you know the financing structures. Uh, are you know does it make you know does it make financing more complex when you're when you involve in Islamic financing and, and regular project finance deals, and um, and then, then the natural question is uh, you know is is the cost of uh, you know financing uh, capital higher uh, in projects for, where we use Islamic financing, and it it goes to actually one of the questions which we received just now by uh, Anas where. Uh, you know, he wants to know uh, that if it is higher, then how do we promote this as a mode of financing? If uh, and how do you compete with conventional? So let's kick off with that, and then we can bring in some other questions which are being asked on the on the chat board. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, quite. Thank you, Ajaz, um, um, for summarizing this uh, uh, quite nicely, and uh, for the questions that. Um, that have been put forward. Um, all these questions are, are very relevant, and as I said, that is quite extensive list of questions. Uh, but um, let, let me touch upon. Uh, let me let me first start with the with the uh, knowledge gap. You you have really identified and pinned it down to the to the point of the knowledge gap. Uh, it's a, it's a um, when we as a practitioner, you know, we go to the market. And uh, we, we, we go and let's say we meet a client and a sponsor. And we said, that, okay, here is the Islamic finance. Would you be interested? And, and uh, you know, we, you, can, you can sense that, you know, the understanding. Oh, we are not sure. Actually, we don't know what you're talking about. Uh, it would be complex and things like that. So, yeah, knowledge gap is an, is an issue. But at the same time, the, the good part about, um, uh, about this um, particular aspect is that uh, IDB, Islamic Development Bank, and other banks, we uh, MDBs specifically, we have uh, very rightly identified this gap, and we started already working on that. Perhaps um, you know um, some of you are aware among the audience that uh, we have um, we are about to launch the PPP certification program uh, jointly with with World Bank and other other MDBs, and the PPP certification program. Uh, we'll have a particular module inside the curriculum which talk about Islamic finance in the context of PPP. So that will, you know, on, on, we're trying to standardize the, the global body of knowledge uh, and it will hopefully uh, address to some extent. There's also uh, a joint MDB initiative. Uh, we call it PPP Knowledge Lab. Again, um, spearheaded by the World Bank and uh, the other other MDBs join hand. Over there also, you will find we are trying to populate and we are trying to enhance the content over there in order to disseminate knowledge 
about about PPPs, the contents of Islamic finance. Major law firms. So when it comes to PPP projects, each PPP project has got extensive, you know, nexus of I would say legal documentation. And uh, I I can tell you, and this is a comforting thing that almost all the major law firms right now globally, they have developed their in-house uh, Islamic finance team. So this is no more a very, I would say, remote thing uh, that the knowledge gap we are, we are trying to add, uh, address it and it has uh, been to some extent uh, addressed. Um, how about the uh, uh, number of um, audience, uh, I think the number of participants today, they asked about the regulatory uh, framework and uh, whether it's, it's a must for uh, Islamic finance uh, in the context of uh, PPP. Uh, the answer is no, actually. So uh, Islamic finance uh, for PPP is it, it's a very much transaction specific uh, um, deal, uh, project uh, or engagement, I would say. So you, you get engaged at a transaction level. Each transaction has got a set of agreements which be, and they are very clearly specified that what would be the governing law. It could be the, you know, uh, not necessarily the governing law of the host country. It could be the governing law of any other uh, places. So it's, it's always good to have, uh, I'm not discounting the need for regulatory, um, you know, framework gear for Islamic finance and facilitating that towards uh, PPP. Uh, definitely it's good to have that. But what I'm saying that that does not stop us for going into countries, going into places and doing PPP projects. I can tell you that um, we work in 56 member countries. Uh, in that 56 member countries, you will not find Islamic uh, regulatory uh, framework uh, in all those countries, but we can do projects in, 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 in all those countries. That is not an issue. Um, case study, definitely, uh, we know the need for case study and uh, Islamic finance in PPP are very much case specific. You know, even two, two power projects, you put them side by side, they would not be the same. So you 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 will have case study and our our next two uh, webinar will specifically focus on case studies. We will pick up one project from uh, power power sector and we will pick up one project from the hospital sector and we'll talk about the about the case uh, in in detail. And I will have with me my uh, my colleague from uh, the legal background, uh, my legal colleague, and who will, will take you, walk you through. And I do invite you, please do come uh, in, the, in the next webinars to discuss about the cases. Okay, cost issue. Definitely uh, important topic, cost issue. And um, at this point, I tell you that no, Islamic finance does not add any additional cost. Uh, if you look at purely from borrower perspective, you know, he or she or the borrower will be paying the same economic cost uh, as long as the lenders group are concerned. We do not impose or we do not introduce uh, by, by way of introducing Islamic finance any additional cost into the transaction. Uh, yeah, I guess over to you. Oh, thanks. We have a, we have a good, very good list of questions, and uh, you know, let me uh, try to start with one of the the, the newer ones that we have from, uh, if I'm pronouncing it right, Funan Nani. Uh, the, the question is uh, that you know that in project financing, the risk is borne ultimately by the the bank's lending, and not necessarily the project company. So I'm struggling to understand how the cost differs from interest payment. Do you okay. want to address that? Yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, you see the, um, I, I, would, I, would, I would comment on the, on the risk component. Mm -hmm. the, the risk is not necessarily uh, borne by the, by the lenders. Lenders do take certain risks, but the, 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 the principle that we work on in any project finance transaction Irrespective of whether there's an Islamic finance there or not, basically is the allocation of risk, right? You you allocate the risk to the party who can 
best handle that. You know, there are risks allocated to the EPC contractor, there are risks allocated to the to the OM contractor, or you have the SPB, the certain risks being taken like the post major events being taken by the by the government. A certain risk perhaps commercial risk being taken by the by the lending lending group. So uh, you know the, the 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 way lender group as a whole or the uh, conventional versus P, uh, you know Islamic lender they price their their product depending on the overall risk profile of the of the project. Uh, so yeah, conventional banks will charge interest rate. Islamic banks will charge in our term the pricing. Uh, in case of uh, Ijara, I mentioned, we'll charge the rental payment. In case of Istisna, we will make our repayment in a deferred uh, payment mode in a way that will build in the pricing of our cost of funding plus the risk that we are taking in. And at the end of the day, that's, that's an interesting topic. I told you that we will make sure we'll, that the pricing of the Islamic bank and the pricing of the conventional bank, they are at par. Uh, and the, sometimes this creates a bit misconception. And I, I again, I refer to my slide where you see some burgers. You know, uh, when you see the two lenders coming with the same pricing, doesn't mean that you know they are same in all aspects. Pricing is just you know how you get compensated for the risk you are taking. The difference in Islamic finance is a recom conventional finance are in the structure, how you structure it. Good. I just over to you. Uh, thanks. Uh, one interesting question uh, that we have is on uh, the fact that, you know, why haven't, hasn't any project been fully financed through Islamic financing? Uh, and uh, let me throw in another one. Uh, where we uh, the the question was about the what kind of rate of return is offered to the developer when the selling price of the asset is decided up front. Okay. Good questions. Okay, let me uh, two two different topics. Okay, so let me take the first question about uh, uh, about the fully Islamic uh, finance transaction. For PPP projects, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, it has been done. I would not say it is done. It, um, we have done, for example, I can readily tell you uh, the uh, two wind projects in Pakistan. Uh, we have done on a fully Islamic mode of financing, jointly with a group of commercial banks, Asian Development Bank and IDB. Right now, we are working on a full uh, Islamic transaction for PPP projects. A hospital uh, in um, in um, Turkey. Uh, uh, I'm unable to disclose the name because of the confidentiality. We're at a very early stage. We are working uh, on a renewable project again on a full Islamic basis in Jordan. Uh, so there are uh, projects, PPP projects, being done on a full Islamic basis. But the question, your question, is still valid. That why there are not not so many projects being done by Islamic uh, Islamic uh, finance fully. The question, uh, the answer is that, uh, you know, there's a demand supply gap and there's a supply constraint. Uh, there are not many banks, Islamic banks, who can really offer long-term project financing facility for, for PPP projects. Uh, you know, that the, the most of the infrastructure projects, PP projects require quite long-term funding, you know, to the north of 15 years, some are even 20 years. We have recently seen projects in the Middle East going as long as 25 years. So uh, not commercial banks, not all commercial banks, you know, be it conventional, be it, be it Islamic, they have the capacity to offer such a long-term funding. So it's a, it's a supply constraint rather than anything else. Thank you. A uh, couple of questions which, you know, are, are uh, uh, around uh, the role of IDB, Islamic Development Bank. Uh, one question uh, that John asked was, to what extent does uh, IDB work with OIC? And uh, then there was another question on 
uh, does IDP also finance the equity portion using equity bridge loans? If so, how is this done? Okay, two question, but uh, um, I just realized that I, I, I skipped the second question of the, the past session about how the Cessna pricing is determined. Uh, let me let me address that. When when we when we provide Cessna financing to a uh, to an SPV uh, to PPP projects, uh, and where you have the other lenders who are charging variable rate, uh, we deploy a mechanism. Uh, which is called the uh, risk, uh, I'm sorry, hedge neutral mechanism uh, to determine our pricing, uh, which is at par with other uh, conventional lenders. The way it works very briefly and uh, in, in our third seminar, I think, our webinar, where we'll talk about the Islamic uh, finance for the hospital project, you will see the full mechanism. But this is a very interesting topic and we, as I said, that we'll have a full slide on that. But uh, to answer your question, the the, the borrower, the SPV, uh, is required to hedge uh, a certain percentage of their uh, pricing exposure, loan pricing exposure. It could be as high as 100%, it could be you know, uh, 75%, depending on, on the project and on the lenders required. So when they will need to hedge, they generally go to a hedging bank and hedge their exposure. Right? And for, let's say for the for the conventional banks, they have to conventional uh, tranches, they have to hedge the interest rate. So uh, it generally happens x number of days before the first disbursement, they have to hedge it for the whole channel, sometimes for the, the, the including the disbursement time and the repayment time. And that hedging price that the company is getting, quotation that the company is getting from the hedge providing bank, we use the that pricing as, as a mechanism to determine our fixed repayment or our pricing of the Istisna assets. So from a purely economic perspective, if you if you put yourself uh, into the shoes of the of the SPV, uh, it is paying the same price in terms of hedging, uh, uh, procuring the hedging to the hedge providing bank, and it's providing the same level of pricing to Islamic Development Bank or any other Islamic bank. So again, it's a risk. That's why we said there is a hedge neutral pricing mechanism uh, that will put us at par with the, with the with the others. And it's good for the it's good for the you know that in in, in any PPP transaction when you have multi lenders, uh, they need to charge the you cannot have different conditions and different uh, you know terms and conditions for different lenders. You have everybody has to be on the same footing, and this mechanism really helps us uh, the Islamic banks to be on the same footing. Vis a vis the, the, the conventional banks. Okay, OIC uh, uh, versus IDB. IDB is, mm, you know, uh, the way uh, OIC is, uh, is an organization of Islamic uh, conference. Uh, the way it works, because IDB uh, member countries are 56. So, IDB, a country to become a member of IDB, they have to become a member of OIC. That's, that's basically the relationship. But, but just for your information, OIC is not a funding institution. It's, it's just an you know, organization and umbrella. Uh, equity bridge loan. Uh, depend, yes, we can do that. We can, we can provide equity. We can provide equity bridge loan. Uh, we haven't done, if you, if you ask about our experience, no, we haven't done that. But uh, I'm not saying that we cannot do that. We can do that. We can do that through a corporate uh, finance structure because, uh, you know, taking the risk of the sponsor and providing a corporate finance structure uh, facility to the sponsor to provide an equity bridge loan. So you are not taking the risk of the project, but taking the risk of the balance sheet of the sponsor. And uh, how it going to do that? It depends on the how what kind of the structure you, you develop. You can develop a corporate suku for that matter. And uh, you, based on the corporate suku, you give I'm using the conventional term so that everybody can understand. You give loan to the to the to the corporate, and that corporate can use that loan to to fund their equity. Um, uh, without going into details, this is this could be the overall mechanism. Yes, I just quickly. And the webinar recording for this webinar will be available on the OLC website uh, 24 hours from now. And we'd like to ask you to please take the time to fill out an OLC survey to make sure that the webinars that we do in the future 
you know, are get better and better each time. So we really appreciate your feedback. Thank you, Fida, for all of your time. And um, thank you to everyone for participating.